on, uh, let's bow our heads for prayer and ask the Lord for his presence as we listen to the message. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the privilege of being able to come to the church. And thank you for giving us the, the time and the power to be able to worship with our church family. We ask that your Holy Spirit be in this place and to um, penetrate the hearts and the minds of all of us, uh, not only here, but to our listening audience um, in, the, uh, um, um, in the media or wherever they are. Uh, may the message that come from my mouth be from you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, one of the things that um, I was contemplating on um, what to talk about today was given as an inspiration. And when we had a uh, youth Sabbath school just across the building over there, and the topic that they were talking about was influence. And uh, you know that, that, that word, influencer. You guys have heard that? How many have heard that? That word has been popular, believe it or not, um, since about 2016 only. 2016. That's only barely seven years ago. Uh, the word itself, influencer, has been here since the 1600s. If you look at the, uh, the dictionary, and you know what it applied to back then? The word applied to, um, let me see. It's a word in astrology. The study of stars. You know what astrology is, right? It says here, the radiation of an ethereal fluid from stars regarded as affecting human actions and destinies. Just as a uh, digression, tomorrow, one of the um, lucky things that I get to experience, I get to experience New Year twice. All right, so we just celebrate our new year, January 1st, 2023. Tomorrow is the day, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the start of Chinese New Year celebration. And we'll, and we'll end for several days, February 9th, I think. And you know what year it is this year for the Chinese lunar year? It's the year of the rabbit. The year of the rabbit. The rabbit is a symbol of longevity, peace, and prosperity. Many have projected that the year 2023 is predicted to be a year of hope. Isn't that amazing? A year of hope. We have hope. And then, of course, there's the, you know, the belief that people born in the year of the rabbit are believed to be vigilant, witty, quick-minded, and ingenious. But this is astrology. We have our own astrology, right, in the Western world. But today's influencers are completely, well, I wouldn't say completely different. They probably like the fact that their influence was rooted in the stars. The top 10 media influencers of today, as of the end of 2022, you may know these names. Who knows Ronaldo? Anybody? He's just one of the greatest football players of all time. He has um, 517 million followers in Instagram and Facebook. That's over half a billion followers. 
All right, how about this guy, uh, Justin Bieber? Anybody know him? Well, almost everybody does, right? He has 455 million followers. The top 10, I'll tell you after that. See, there's, uh, see if you guys know this. Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Taylor Swift, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, Katy Perry, Kylie Jenner, Rihanna, Kim Kardashian. All of these top 10 have, has over 300 million followers. By the way, uh, for those of you who are World Cup fans, I, I'm one of them, uh, Lionel Messi came at, at number 11. He only has 298 million followers. Maybe now, it's probably double that, right? The top 50, the, the, the 50th guy on this list has 134 million followers. One of the things about the pandemic that to me is considered a great blessing is that we have extended our church in the internet, in the media. We have people following right now on YouTube and Facebook and other types of media. We shut down the church physically, but we kept service going. That's amazing. Today, an influencer, this is how they define it. An influencer is someone who has the power to affect the purchasing decisions of others because of his or her authority, knowledge, position, or relationship with his or her audience. They also have a following and a distinct niche with whom he or she actively engages. The purpose of influencers is what? Totally and absolutely commercial. That's for us who are influenced to buy things, to buy stuff. Most of it probably we don't need or want, but guess what? Influencers, one author puts it, is a superpower. If you can change somebody's behavior with them voluntarily doing that, right? You don't need to use force. You don't need the law. You don't need a police officer or a soldier. You don't need a gun in your head to say, hey, do this. Isn't that power? And so we have influencers. Now, open your Bibles with me, um, Matthew 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to spend a lot of time in Matthew today. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. This is what the Bible says. And in my Bible, it's in red letters. So red letters mean that who said this? Jesus. I read, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand and gives it light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's the words to Jesus. He's telling every one of us, right? You are an 
influencer. So one of the lessons today with the youth over there, they were talking about influencers as well. One of the things about influence is there are many, many, many things that you say or do and you don't know, we don't know, that we are influencing others. Have you ever seen that commercial where this guy was sitting in a bus stop and he saw a guy open the door for an elderly woman? She goes in. Inside the bus, there's a guy sitting. He saw a man comes up, offered the seat to another disabled person. And that person goes out and helps another person and so on, and it ripples, just like when you throw stone in the water, right? The bubbles ripples like this, right? But you don't know, but you're doing that. We're doing that. The problem is that today, the power of influencers is self-serving. So one of the ideas associated with Christian influencers that we emphasized in the youth lesson last week, or two weeks ago actually, was to be an effective influencer, you have to have humility. Huh? That's anti-typical of the current world's influencers, right? These guys are millionaires and billionaires. They have the power to compel people just by saying, hey, I like this product, and boom. Out of the 500 million followers, hey, if they can just get 10% to buy that product, guess what? So, being an influencer is a superpower. Back in 1984, there was a man by the name of Robert uh, C. Aldini. He's a psychologist. And he published a book entitled Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. There's another book out there... Um, I think it's re uh, recently written in 2018 by another author. Um, same kind of vein, but his, the title of his book is 15, 15 uh, ways of, oh, oh no, 15 principles of biblical, 15 biblical principles of persuasion. Okay, but it comes down to these six principles way back in 1984. Um, tell me if this right or wrong in your experience. To be an effective influencer, and that's, that's what this is. This was written mainly for, again, for commercial purpose. You have to have, number one, reciprocity. Oh, what does that mean? Um, has anybody ever done you a favor? Wouldn't you like to return that favor? Human nature, right? One of the most effective ways of marketing a product is what? You can go to the, um, where's that, the beauty section in, in the mall today, and there will be people there doing you what? Makeovers, right? And guess what? They spend a little bit to make you over, and you buy samples good for the year, and that earns the manufacturers of their, you know, their money, right? So giving samples is one act of reciprocity, all right? So if somebody does something for you, guess what? You want to return the favor. Um, the other one is that there is commitment and consistency. What does that mean? Have you ever gone to a website in the um, internet and you refuse their product, and at the end they say, hey, would you like us to sign you up and talk to you later? It seems harmless, isn't it? We'll talk to you later. But when you click that button, the square box, or whatever it is, you've just committed yourself 
to that whatever they're wanting you to buy. You might not buy it now, but guess what? You may end up buying it later. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Right? Have you ever gone to Costco? How many of you have gone to Costco? I think we call that store either the $300 or the $400 store. Isn't it? You go in there, you're wanting to buy one piece of whatever it is that you're wanting, right? And you get to the counter and guess what? You're spending $300 or $400. Like, you never, you know, okay. So Costco, by the way, does research on their customers. They know each and every one of us. They know exactly how much money we make, and they go, this is what the people that makes this income, this is what they need. Not necessarily want, they need. So guess what? When you go into Costco, you go, oh, look at that. I need that. <laughs> and then your $50 shopping spree comes out to be about $300 or $400. Social proof. People will do things that they see other people doing. Um, ever heard, uh, ever seen um, somebody look up? Everybody still goes, what? Okay, there is, uh, psychologically, we call that the herd psychology, right? Human beings are herd. If you look at mammals in the animal kingdom, they move as one. They spread out like one when chased by a prey. Well, humans are no different. We're mammals too, okay? And so when some important figure says, hey, look at this. I'm doing the workout. You know, I used to watch the Chuck Norris workouts. Remember that? The guy's 70 years old and he's still in good shape. And guess what? The next day, I'm working out at the gym. Right? Have you ever seen a workout personality um, who sells gym equipment that's out of shape? Never happens. They, they, everybody looks good. So you, you, know, so you want to follow those guys. That's just human nature, right? Our minds are drawn to, if somebody is doing it that way, hey, you know what? I can do it. So that's number three principle. Number four, authority. People will tend to obey authority figures. Even they are asked to perform an ob objectionable acts. What I mean by that is there was this experiment, right? They put a person in a room and hooked up some electrodes in their hands and their bodies, right? The people that were called in and say, hey, if you press this electrode, you're going to get an electric shock to the person. It's a, you know, it's a fairly low level shock, right? And then, of course, the scientists that were conducting the experiment says, I'm going to keep increasing the shock, but it's not going to harm the person. So, you just, so when we tell you, you just keep pressing that button. The guy in the other room was screaming at the end of the experiment, but the, the scientist said, it's okay, it's not harmful to them, just keep pressing the button. One of the things that um, they said about um, Germany pre-World War II of why, as a society as a whole, you know, the Germans' society pre-war either knew that the Jews were being killed, or actually, they knew that they were being killed, but what? They follow the authorities. A soldier will shoot somebody, right? Well, I just did it because I was ordered to. All right? So authority. Number five, uh, people have to like you if you want to sell them something, right? Uh, if you don't like a person don't like what they dress, they look, they talk, you're not going to buy stuff from them. Number six, whatever product you're selling or service, it has to be scarce. Right? Have you ever heard that commercial when this commercial said, hey, oh, we have 10 cars in the, the lot, 
You need to come now because it's going to last, the sale's going to last till tomorrow. Better get the car now. Or, you know what? Um, the first 100 products will be 50% off. It's creating a perception of scarcity. And so what happens? There's pressure to buy things. What about us, church? We are called by Jesus to be fishers of men. To go out there and baptize other disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Our mission is to make the church grow. We are influencers, after all. Whether you like it or not, when you become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, or Christians, or whatever denomination, others out there, we become influencers of others. And therefore, an amazing and heavy responsibility. Let me point you out to Jesus. One of the articles I was reading. Is this article. It, it says entitled, 12 Ways Jesus Changed the World. One of the benefits that we have in history as compared to people before, his, before Jesus came to this world, is we see the cause and the effect of Jesus' life. We can look back. We can see what happens. Would you agree with me that Jesus was the influencer of our time? There is no one person in history that affects individuals. To compel a person to choose Jesus, to preach, to go to prison, to endure beatings, to die, by choice, none. For women, Cicero, one of the great Roman philosophers, compared women to things. They're just donkeys and horses. They can be do away with. They're just useful things. Cast away when we want. What did Jesus say? Galatians 3.28. There is neither male nor female. There's no Jew or Greek. Slave or free, we are all one in Christ Jesus. The effect of Jesus on our history is amazing. The influencer for our time. Family life, what did Jesus say? Modern local culture should love this. Jesus said, Husbands, submit to your wife. There's this element of submission in marriage, you see. They submit to each other. Husbands are called to be head of the family, but what? You are to die for your family, if needed, for defense. That concept, you guys, didn't exist before Jesus came. You know that. What did Jesus do to the church? What did Jesus affect? What does Jesus, how did Jesus affect civil government? 
What does the first lines of the uh, Declaration of Independence do? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator, an inalienable right. The Constitution was based on Christian values. Christianity, Jesus, the Magna Carta, Republican government. Our freedoms today was based on Jesus, the principles of living. How did Jesus affect education? Not 600 years ago, education was, no, I would say 600. I would even say 400 years ago. Women weren't even included in education, right? Only the top elite people in society were entitled to an education. But today we have schools everywhere. Somebody said that the first 120 universities in the United States, including Harvard, were established by Christians, amplifying Christian values. Businesses. Back in the Middle Ages and even further out, as far as we can see, there was no middle class. You're either poor, part of the 99%, or the nobility, top 1%. The book by Adam Smith was written by Christians with Christian principles and hence the growth of free enterprise. And believe it or not, Jesus was an influence in science. Huh? Today, scientists kind of try to find proof that God does not exist, that everything just happened by chance. You see? Uh, but Jesus influenced Isaac Newton, Galileo. They were all in search of wisdom and truth. The arts... One of the privileges of being able to travel um, to different countries in Europe is to go to museums and different cathedrals and be able to see art. The Sistine Chapel, the Louvre. I mean, you can see paintings after paintings after paintings, and it has the mark of Jesus. What did he do to faith? Jesus strengthened faith. People from the Middle Ages, Christians were persecuted in the Colosseums. The Waldensians, they hid in hills because they were sought after. People strength, their faith strengthened because of Jesus. What about hope? Do we have hope as a Christian church, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian church? Yes. One of the things that Jesus brought was this assurance that there is a what? A future. We have a future. Death does not end us. We don't go into oblivion. We have a hope. And we know what Jesus showed us, love and compassion. Let me read to you something here that um, kind of moved me. Um, this is, inspirations come from, uh, I, I get this God minute that I get every day in the day of the week. It's from Dan Smith. And he was talking about Jesus. Um, it's actually a poem uh, written back in 1926. And he was not a Seventh-day Adventist preacher that, pre that wrote this. It was by the author by the name of Reverend James Allen Francis. The reason why I'm going to read this poem is because we are called to be influencer, 
the salt of the earth, the light of this world. And when you listen to this poem, think about the influencers of our current day. This is how the poem started. He was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in an obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never wrote a book. In fact, Jesus didn't write anything or held an office. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. I would have to say that the trial, the verdict was already set. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for all the only piece of property he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. The poem said, 19 centuries have con come and gone. I can say 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he is still the central figure for much of the human race. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together has not affected the life of men upon this earth as powerful as this one solitary life. My challenge for you this morning, or this afternoon, it is a high standard to be called an influencer. Our leader is Jesus. He didn't write a single word. He just spoke. He wasn't even educated. And yet he affected every one of our lives here today. You're here because of him. If you follow the principles of influencers, he has done all of those. Reciprocity. What has Jesus done? He died for all of us. He died in our stead. Commitment and consistency. Jesus said what? I was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God has never changed. You want social proof about Jesus? He just told his disciples, follow me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You think Jesus claimed authority? One of the most important things about this, uh, this story is how the Pharisee was arguing. The Jews were arguing with him who he is. 
right? That story is in, um, is in John 8.58, if you have to read that story. But the question came, are you greater than Abraham? He said, before Abraham, I am. They tried to stone him for that. You see, he, Jesus was claiming to be what? Did people like him? There's the uh, text that I like uh, in Matthew 9, 14. Suffer the little children to come and to me. The children, the kids loved him. And you know what they say, suffer, right? Children were considered people. You know, back then you could throw away your kids and you won't be condemned. They're not considered anything. But Jesus said what? Suffer the little children to come unto me for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? And finally, in terms of scarcity, there's a story in Matthew, one of my favorite stories. Matthew 14, if you want to care to look at that. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. You can read that story. The setting was that there was two feasts, right? One was Herod's. One was Jesus. What, what happened in Herod's feast? And you could imagine a king's feast back then. There was abundance. There was great food. There was celebration. There was entertainment, whatever you think. But what happened at Herod's feast? Salome's daughter asked for John the Baptist's head. And it was delivered in a platter. The feast of Jesus was after this. What did he do? He was tired. He just heard the news that his cousin was killed. And yet, he said, let's go and withdraw. Let's go to the wilderness. But the people just could not leave him alone. They loved him. They liked him. And so they followed him in the wilderness. And then the evening came, and then he said, we got to feed these people. They're hungry. The disciples said, well, we don't have food. Where are we going to get food? We're in the middle of the wilderness. Oh, by the way, we found this. There's two fishes and five loaves. And what did Jesus do? He said, bring it to me. And he fed 5,000 men. The women weren't even counted. The kids not counted. So we're talking probably 10,000, maybe 12,000 even, from two fishes and five loaves. On our key text today, Matthew 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to you. To your Father. The cornerstone you see of being an effective influencer is humility. Jesus, the King of Kings, came in as a baby, born in a manger, lived an obscure life. We even doubt that he existed. Some historians don't believe that he existed, in fact. And yet that one solitary, obscure life had this enormous effect on the destiny of men. I love the quote that C.S. Lewis said about humility. He said, humility is not thinking of ourselves. In fact, the quote was, humility 
is not thinking more of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. That doesn't mean that we're doormats. That doesn't mean that, you know, that we take it. But we have principles. And humility, did you, <laughs> did you know that humility didn't become a virtue till probably in the 15, 1600s? Before that, what was humility? It was considered weakness. But one of the most powerful things that Jesus did, he had the power of thought to banish all his enemies in one thought. And yet, he submitted with humility to the crown of thorns, to the mock trial, to the death of a criminal, a painful way on the cross. And yet he became the influencer for our time 2,000 years ago. And we look forward to that time with the hope that we have that we will see him again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for saving us we were condemned, and yet Jesus came down to humble himself in humility and to die a criminal's death to save us all. It is a profound, profound wonder and awe that we could think about how he could do that for us. We are mere creatures and creation. And yet, you as the King of Kings and the Creator of all the universe did this work of salvation with submission and humility. We pray that that impresses our hearts and our minds of the standard of which you called us to be influencers in this world so that the mission of this church to expand your kingdom will be more and more effective as we go each day. We look forward to the second coming and we look forward to the time when Jesus triumphs and that uh, we will greet him as our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.